welcome to the hero's journey today. Super <laughs> cool um, topic that we're going to be talking about involving storytelling and then also getting you really to think about your own story and your own hero's journey today. And Charles and I will have a good talk about some good films and um, hopefully you'll be able to come around to, yeah, where you're at in your point. And I'm Christina McGrath. My company is Swell Fit Living and I do mind and body optimization, including nutrition and movement programs, online coaching, and yeah, and these awesome webinars. <laughs> Charles. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all again. Um, right, so as, as, as I was last week, I am this week, uh, still a designer, still mucking around with webinars, still mucking around with blogs, still writing, still doing stuff, just trying to sort of fill the space of time in one sense. Um, but this week we've got a subject which is um, which I adore. I mean, and always have adored. Uh, even as a little child, as do most children, I love stories. Um, but or not, but and for me, like everybody else, stories were there basically to to tell me something entertaining, and then they carried messages and that's partly what we're here to talk about tonight is how what stories do what i'm going to start with though is just to explain um probably from a philosophical point of view more than although it is partly how the brain works or how they believe the brain works i should say so our brains basically are um pattern makers we're hardwired to find patterns we can't help ourselves. It's what we do. It's how our neurons work. It's, um, it's how we string things together. So what our brains do is they see event, 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 event. And they think, oh, hang on a minute. There's a pattern here. There's, uh, there's a sequence. There's something that is going on. Once we, once, we, once we sort of created a pattern, we then need to make meaning from it. We need to overlay on top of that pattern some sort of meaning and in effect this is how we make stories and that's why stories are so um, completely integral to everything we do we say we think we feel we understand we perceive stories are right at the sort of core of everything so if you think uh, the way i think about stories is that stories are basically events plus repetition which makes pattern so events and pattern uh, and repetition make pattern pattern and interpretation and then me equals meaning and meaning communication means story and that could be fact it could be fiction i include in stories science as well and most scientific theories they are uh, a way of understanding something be it the universe or be it just the way a vacuum cleaner works or whether it's whether little red riding hood really did get eaten by the wolf whatever it is they all sort of carry with them something. They carry meaning and they carry ways that we can, um, we adjust how we see the world. And that's something called mental models. So we build our mental models, which are built on events, patterns, meaning, and then stories. Stories is what we have. And they can be good. They can be bad. They can be terrible, repetitive thoughts, but they then sort of go on to form our assumptions and from our assumptions, we form our beliefs, and then we reinterpret. There's this horrendous circle of things that because of what we see, because of the stories we tell, the way our, our mental models work, we then reinterpret the world in that way until something comes along. The change it maybe slightly. So, but the, the thing about stories, of course, which makes them very special, is that they carry content which has meaning over time. <laughs> and I think that's pretty much how uh, you can view all, to some extent, all communication, but it is story, is that it's content which has meaning and is based over time. If it didn't have the time element within it, we couldn't use the stories for the thing that they primarily were used for, which is to predict. So having seen an event, an event, and an event, we then give it meaning, and then we look at the meaning, and then we think, ah, I know what's coming next. So the sun rises every day, and this is because, of course, the sun is revolving around us, 
so therefore it will come up again in the morning. Um, of course, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that stories have to be correct. It's just how we interpret the world. But um, meaning is what's necessary for effective communication. And the method that we use for that, I think that we all use, um, well or badly, is story. Um, and we use it because we want to change how people think or we want to change an event, or we want someone to understand something in a different way. Um, science is always a great sort of example for me because science is constantly, constantly evolving. You know, we think we have, we've got everything we need to know about everything, but then somebody tinkers with it and suddenly they come in with a new sort of insight and that becomes a new story, a new interpretation. I mean, before Einstein, of course, um, Newton was everything that there was to do with science in terms of gravity, in terms of the laws of motion. Then, of course, Einstein comes on and gives us a new story. Very complex story, it has to be said. But he does, he gives us a new story. And then on the other end of that, we have entertainment as well. And stories, I think, are used for lots of different purposes. And this, next week, we're going to talk about the application of stories. But this week, we're going to talk about the structure of stories and how they are an incredible metaphor for, for life in general, which is why they're so long enduring. Because um, stories, basically, I think, um, and we were discussing this earlier, is stories change people. You know, you use a story to persuade somebody to do something. Either, you know, buy this, well, you don't, just say buy this you say buy this because I've done this and this is going to solve your problem um, so stories are there to persuade to negotiate to um, to inform um, and with that they change people and they change behavior when you change behavior then you begin to change communities when you begin to change communities then you begin to change organizations and then if we filter into that the political world as well the politics is built on storytelling that's Essentially, what um, storytelling in combination with mental models is, or politics is all about. And once you begin to sort of inject sort of story into brands, politics, communication, and everything, what you find is actually that you're, you're grad gradually, gently changing the world. So, or at least you may not be changing the world exactly, but you're certainly changing. In fact, you're not changing the world really, although you are because you're influencing it. But what you're actually doing is you're changing your view of the world and your collective views of the world. So <coughs> in terms of politics, it's very really easy to see how, you know, stories win elections, basically, if you've got a good, strong story. Well, now we call it probably a slogan or a soundbite, then that can win an election. If it hits the right note, that will win. So the, the other sort of undercurrent with stories uh, and, and I will always go back to fairy tales, to cartoons, to parables, to fables, to all the things that I grew up with, is that um, stories carry things with them. They're like little sort of um, couriers. So they're, they're bringing either, I mean, and I've got a big list here to talk about, about things that stories carry. The first thing, of course, is uh, life lessons. They carry lessons. They carry um, life-changing um, morality with them. We'll come to morality. They carry perhaps observations with them as well. You know, I've seen this, this, and this, which means this, this, and this. Or inside, somebody suddenly sees something afresh. <laughs> and the way they communicate that is with a story, of course. Um, messages, just pure simple messages. You know, if, if one person wants to tell somebody something, they do it via maybe a, a tiny short story that is there in order to convey some sort of information, some, some sort of message. But there's still more to it, a lot more, I think. Um, meaning, hidden meaning, stories carry meaning. What amazes me, um, and, and you know, half an hour ago we were discussing this, is that from whatever I say to you, um, now or to Christina or to anybody 
whatever I say, you will get some sense of who I am. It might be wrong, of course, but it might not be wrong. But you get more than the words are saying. And there's body language, there's lots of other things included, but that's all part of story, is that stories carry it along and carry the communication, that sort of connection between us. Um, and we're doing it now. You're, you're no doubt sort of forming an opinion, hopefully a good one, I don't know, but we shall see. But also, I mean, stories bring knowledge. I mean, they bring knowledge big time. Um, so, you know, when we want to know something, we usually want to know something because we want to have a, to use it for a purpose and we need somehow to communicate that knowledge. Uh, and that, that goes for practical knowledge as well. And, you know, even um, we were talking also about uh, physical knowledge as well that, uh, and physical practice as well. These are all forms of story. I mean, dance is the obvious example of, of physical stories. Um, Stories are used also for teaching and instruction um, massively. I mean, again, uh, teaching is a form of influencing and instructing is a form of influencing. It might be benign, it might be very nice and very good, but it is a form of, um, of uh, manipulating, of influencing and negotiating with people. And I think we use stronger and stronger stories depending on the severity or the need of the negotiation we're trying to do. I mean, an argument is a great example, which always gets completely out of hand, is that we will use a stronger or louder <laughs> story in order to win an argument. If we weren't going to try to win the argument, then why would we bother to sort of tell anybody anything? We would just accept it. Um, so with, with stories comes people, identity, personality, and then comes the sort of the dark side from underneath, which is, of course, and this is com communicated so brilliantly in fairy tales, in cartoons, in parables and fables, is morality and ethics. So we have this weird thing in communities, in societies, is this collective consciousness. And the way that we preserve that is with our, um, with our stories that we share, basically. We share common values. Well, common values are basically stories that we share. So in story, in fairy tales, in cartoons, in parables, in all of these things, particularly if you take La Fontaine, there, there's always the moral of the story is. Well, the same with Little Red Riding Hood. There is a moral in the story. <laughs> and it carries with it and it's it's a behavioral moral as well this learn this and you will be okay um or it, or it, has, it carries with it ethics as well um and inside that as well another package inside the package is it carries with it of course the cultures that we share or don't share or that want to influence us the creativity that we have so creativity is pretty sort of redundant if you can't tell somebody about it. And that is a new story. I also sort of have a, a sort of theory that I haven't really explored, which is that um, creativity is actually just about <coughs> telling better stories or different stories or revealing stories, stories that reveal something about the human condition. Um, and and that, that brings on the next really big thing, apart from controlling behavior and changing behavior, is transformation. Um, I had a, a big argument with my children uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I think I may have mentioned it in every single webinar since, because I lost. Um, I said that all stories were basically about transformation. And um, we sort of searched all kinds of stories from films to books to, um, to everything that we've ever sort of come in contact with. And then my son found the one exception that didn't follow any transformation, and that was Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett, where nothing happens and nothing changes. And I thought, ah, you got me. So you what. But, but apart from that, <laughs> Stories are about our collective consciousness and our ability to communicate, to motivate, and to unify people with stories. Now, Umberto Eco has got this, um, or wrote when he was alive, he wrote this um, 
this short essay, which basically stated that if um, we didn't have an enemy, we would have to invent them. So stories are not always about motivating things for good. They're sometimes also for motivating things for bad and for unifying people, because obviously we invent enemies, um, as you can see in the Cold War, in, in sort of many, many, many examples. We invent um, stories about outsiders, about the, the evil, whatever they are outside. Um, um, in this case, it was the, the Russians or the USSR. Um, in order to unify ourselves in a common cause. So stories have this power as well. The last bit, that, or not quite the last bit, but another bit about um, stories and what I think really sort of um, attracts us most is the, this concept of magic. Um, stories are about magic and revelation, or oh, good stories, I should say. Um, or maybe darkly evil stories are all about magic, revelation, and about transformation. So I, I still stick with my theory, even if I was proven wrong, that um, stories are about, um, first instance, they're about how our brains actually work. We can't, we can't interpret anything unless we attach an associative story to it. And that's how we interpret things. And then eventually, apart from using them for negotiation, for influencing, for changing behavior, and for, um, for collectively gathering together culture, society, and behavior, we get magic and revelation from them. And, and I think those things are incredibly important. Now, magic, and I've been, I've, I've been to banned from speaking about it, but Christina said, whatever you do, don't talk about religion. But Religion is a kind of magic. And, you know, it's a, it is about revelation. It is about spiritual health. So, I mean, what religion doesn't give us a powerful story? And that's what attracts people to them. Apart from the reality of the truth, which I'm not going to go into at all. Uh, I promised I wouldn't. Um, but I do think that stories are really about um, magic, about transformation, about revelation. And that is part of the messages that it carries with it. And if they're very good, then there's huge transformations that happen with them and huge magic as well. And it, it's, a, it's a sort of, it's a dark art. You know, some people are wonderful storytellers. Some people can communicate fabulously in logical fashion so that they take you on a journey, which is where we're going to get to in a moment. Um, so they take you on a journey in order to transform you or to show you how someone else was transformed and that you can transform yourself too. So there's a simple formula really. Um, once you sort of, once you've strung together sort of meaning and events in time, then there's a very simple formula. Now the, this formula <laughs> is, it comes in lots of forms I would say. There are the 14 steps or the seven steps or the three steps or the 10 steps. There's hundreds of them and there's hundreds of books about them. Um, and uh, we were both listening to um, the Heroes Two Journeys, uh, which is a brilliant um, uh, seminar given by two screenwriters who really do understand the effect that stories have and how to manipulate that effect. What interests me is that people manipulate it. So this is the simple form of the formula. And if you can keep in your mind, I mean, for me, in my mind, the film is Pinocchio. I think, Christina, it was um, one of the Star Wars films, The Rise of Skywalker. But do you know what? I think 99.9% .9 of all films, particularly American films, um, follow this formula. And here it is. You ready? I was going to say one more thing before yes, you go on. I think, I think the one thing about the stories is, you know, how Charles is talking about like what stories carry is that because we relate to patterns and we always are looking for solutions to our own problems is like, instead of saying like, Hey, you should be a good person. If I tell you a story about a good person, we can relate a lot better. So I feel like that's why stories have the, just the power to change lives. And when we go into this simple formula, thinking about yourself 
as kind of the character or the hero or perhaps a guide in somebody else's story. So I invite you when we're talking about the simple formula to either think about what you're going through right now or possibly a place in your life that you've um, told the story or had the story or where you are in your story. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. And also don't forget to think about a film whilst you're doing it. Exactly. Because we're going to ask questions later and you better know the answers. So yeah. here it is. Yeah. Right. This one's in seven steps, but believe me, we'll come to the hero's journey itself, which, um, which was Joseph Campbell's um, sort of breakdown of story, which is 10 or 11 steps or however you want to sort of count it. But here it is. So I'm going to run through it very quickly and then we'll come back to the point because it's a character that we care about, has a problem or desire or need, often suppressed and unknown to them, and meets a guide who gives them a plan that calls them to action and they reach an obstacle that they must overcome that, are, that helps them to avoid failure and ends in success. They return home transformed. Very, very, very simple formula, but so beautiful and so right. So let's take character first, a character, right? Tom Hanks, why is Tom Hanks so successful in films? Because we care. Because whatever he does, whatever film he makes, or Meg Ryan for that matter, we care. We instantly have an empathy with them. Um, there's another part of the, the sort of the story formula is that they have to start from a place. And that's why most films you see normal life. And we'll come to the actual diagram of how that all works in a moment. You have to start with normal life and you have to return to normal life. So a character has a problem or a desire or a need. Well, in my case, if it's Pinocchio, then Pinocchio is a puppet. He's not really a boy yet. He wants to become a boy and he doesn't know how to do it at all. So the next stage is, and you know, where they say meets a guide who gives them a plan. Now the guide could be a circumstance, could be an object, but it's more often than not a person. There's lots of obvious, easy examples. I got uh, Yoda, Gandalf, uh, Christina, you said Morpheus. Morpheus from the- Donkey, Netflix. donkey's yeah, the brilliant. Donkey, the well, donkey, donkey can um, shrink. Because, yeah, because donkey brings, um, brings that sort of idiot savant humorist <laughs> stuff to it. And, and he makes, but he makes Shrek confront himself. He th Shrek yes. thinks he's complete, but he has a desire. And his desire is not to just be on his own in his swamp. He wants friends. That's what he really, really wants. But he's, he's not aware of it. He denies it first, as we'll come to in a moment. Um, so Donkey does. He, he helps him. He inspires him to move on. He isn't the, the hero. He isn't the perpetrator of the plan. And he calls him to action. Now, um, that can be a very complex section, of course. But, you know, if you think of Lord of the Rings, of course, the call to action is, you know, we're going to go on a quest to find the ring. Um, and that's very simple. But the journey to that point is very complex, it's very hard, it's very difficult. And there's massive, massive um, obstacles to overcome. So the story formula you can begin to see is a sort of um, metaphor or, or guide for problem solving as well you could actually take it to say right where are we now um what is the problem what do we want to solve once you've worked that out how are we going to sort of find solutions to this problem we know what we have to do that's the call to action and then of course as with james dyson you failed 2655 times or whatever it was um in order to succeed but you have to overcome all of those and they're not lost Nothing is lost. Um, so, I think one of the things ahead. that Charles and I was talking, we're talking about, um, especially <laughs> the heroes to um, the heroes to, I guess, guidelines, is that you can't skip over the no. transformation. Well, I think what we we were talking about was the fact that if it wasn't if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't yeah, be. Yeah, it wasn't hard. hard. So if it isn't difficult, then, well, you know, 
you know, n no great film ever sort of um, started and finished by saying, well, um, here's, the, here's the hero, he drives to work, he gets to work, and then he yeah. goes home. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't exactly. work. It's not a story. Yeah. Where's the conflict? Where's the problem? What yeah. did he solve? What did, what, yeah, what did he have to overcome? Form? What happened? But yeah. no, it doesn't work like that. I mean, yeah. even, I was just thinking also this, in uh, La La Land, of course, it starts out with exactly that. They're just driving to work. There is no real problem. But of course, the problem is, what are they going to do with their lives? That's the problem. Yeah. And how are they going to craft their lives? And what problems do they have to overcome for it? And of course, love is one of those problems that they have to resolve as well. <laughs> so you have to overcome an obstacle, and then you, um, you eventually sort of, um, you either avoid failure, which is also a method of succeeding, or it ends in success. Now, tragedy is slightly different, of course, because in tragedy, the hero does not succeed. And that's the difference. So there are sort of nuances on the story pattern, because tragedy is slightly different in that the hero attempts to overcome insurmountable problems and then fails, but others are transformed as a result. I mean, you, have, you only have to look at any Shakespeare play to see that not only, for instance, Romeo and Juliet, which is the best example ever, of course, is that because of their death and their suffering, the whole community is united and transformed as a result. It's not them that wins, they die. Um, but, and they die because of a, a stupid mistake, a tragedy, but they did have to overcome many obstacles in order to get there, and they proved that there was true love. Um, I think that the thing is that, I think we need to sort of start moving on to um, Joseph Campbell's sort of um, hero's journey, which is the main sort of meat and potatoes of this talk. Yeah. And, but there's one little caveat to go to first, which is there are two journeys. It's not one journey. Um, very important to understand this. And if you're ever going to watch a film again, bear this in mind. There are two journeys. Every hero goes on two journeys. One is the objective, the outer story. This is the material thing. This is, this is everything that we can see. This is the events of the story. And the other story, that's the outer story. And the other story is the inner story, the subjective story. How does he transform? And a film that fails is one where nobody changes. That's mm. where a film really fails. I mean, they fail for lots of other reasons too, but uh, bad acting. Or, but, you know, if you take, for instance, The Wizard of Oz, probably the worst acted movie of all time. It's just appalling. But what a great story. You know, and everybody had within themselves all the things that they needed to succeed in the end, but they didn't realize they had it. So they had to go through the journey, the Yellow Brick Road, in order to eventually kill the Wicked Witch of the West, and then to find out, well, there's no place like home. Oh, yes, I really do have a heart. And yes, I am intelligent, really. So everybody had the qualities that they first needed when they started, and yet they went through this amazing arc, very badly acted, I have to say. It looks like a piece of vaudeville. <laughs> and then they are transformed. They are transformed and they go back home. That's the important part, is they do go back home. Because if you don't take it back to normality, then you might as well sort of still live uh, in fantasy land. So, the hero's journey. Ready, Christina? Yeah, let's so, go. <laughs> so... This formula really is, um, it's a formula for, for every life situation, I think. I think that's where Christina comes at it from. And it's a perfect metaphor for, um, for any obstacle, for any problem solving, and sort of almost a method of solving it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a slide up, which is the, the hero's journey. Yeah. Put the slide up and then we can start to talk about each yep. point. Let me just get the hero's journey. Where are you? Oh, oh, there it is. Right. So this is um, just a quick condensed version of the hero's journey. So um, everybody starts in the ordinary world, in their normal world. And um, 
uh, if you think of The Hobbit or you think of Lord of the Rings, they get a call to adventure. Um, most of us um, do refuse that call and avoid it and try to get out of it. Um, <laughs> and then we meet a mentor who then sort of shows us the way um, I think and begins to give I us a plan. So I've got an example. First, but first, yeah. with the refusal of the call, I feel like that's in every Star Wars movie, there's always somebody that's always like, um, they're like, you have to save the world. And they're like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not into it today. Not my I don't problem. Do that. <laughs> it's not my problem. And then there's this tipping point where they're like, well, now I got it. You know, now it's, um, now it's personal. And now I actually have to follow that, that call. Right. And the other thing with the refusal of the call, it's usually they're like, well, I'll do everything else, but just not this one thing. If you ask yeah. me to do this one thing, I can't do it, but I can do literally everything else in the world. And, um, and, and that is the one thing that they must do. And that is the one thing that they have to do. They yeah. have to leave. Every hero usually has to leave to some magical world to, in order to do some training. Um, yeah. And that's where the real story starts and the transformation begins. I'll tell you a very brief, um, uh, it's not really a metaphor, it's, it's actually reality, is that I sort of always had the feeling, oh, I really ought to do webinars and stuff, but, you know, I can't be asked to get onto video and to do it. And I don't know, you know, I don't like it. I don't want to. And then, uh, so I had the call to action and I completely and utterly was avoiding it. Then Christina came along and said, uh, hey, look, why don't we just do a webinar? And for some reason, without me knowing why, out of my mouth came, yeah, let's just do it. And then suddenly I'm doing it. So uh, you need a mentor. Christina, in this case, was my mentor and has encouraged me to do it. And I thoroughly enjoy doing them, I must say. I mean, it, it, they're great fun. But so you've met your mentor, whoever that may be. And that mentor then takes you to this point called crossing the threshold. Now, the, the sort of the metaphor of all of this is that now you begin to descend from the ordinary world into the special world. Um, and I'm not trying to say that these webinars are the special world, but that would be nice to think. But, but um, you do then begin to descend into the underworld. Um, this is where other things happen. You reach challenges or you, you, you get challenges, you're tested, you find your allies, you find your enemies. Um, and from that, you then collect your forces, your resources. Uh, if you remember, one of the things that I always preach is that there's only two things that you can actually control. Uh, one is your attitude and the other is the resources that you apply your effort. So here, at this point, you rally your resources and you come to your first test. These are not big tests yet. These are the smaller tests. And I, so, think, it's, and I think it's important in this crossing the threshold, the hero or you are, are meeting different things in this, this different place, this new place. And <laughs> sometimes it's almost a beginner's mind where a couple of the obstacles you encounter, you are successful. And then all of a sudden you think it's gonna be easier, but then there's probably another huge obstacle which tests, tests that, how much this you can is, perform. This is the great ordeal. This is, yes. this is the bottom of the pit. This is the lowest you will descend where you think everything is impossible now. It just cannot go any worse than this, <laughs> uh, but the hero overcomes, overcomes this problem. Now, there's a, um, Joseph Campbell sort of uh, cites this as being the abyss, death and rebirth, the great ordeal. Uh, and there's more examples than I'm allowed to cite about death and rebirth. Um, I mean, we get it in almost everything. Death doesn't necessarily mean uh, actual death, but it may mean the death of an idea. It may mean, mean the death of an assumption. It may mean uh, putting uh, or, or burying, literally burying an old idea in favor of a new one. So there's this sense of death and rebirth at the bottom of the story. And the other thing is a lot, of, I like a lot of the Star Wars movies because, and a lot of them, 
you know, whether it's Luke um, battling himself, I know, like, and then in the latest one, The Rise of Skywalker, <laughs> where she, her actual, um, the biggest challenge to her was the, is facing her demons, facing herself. So I feel yeah. like in the ordeal, there's also a, a facing of your own shadows that you have to deal with in order not to go to the dark side um, and then have this transformation into this, this new life. Or this That's new interesting, life. actually, because in, in the, um, uh, the, the rise of Skywalker, what uh, Ray, I think the, the, lead act, the lead actor's name, uh, the lead character is, um, what she has to face is that moment where she thinks, maybe I will go to the dark side. And, yeah. and it's very, very obvious. I think the thing that, that my criticism would be of The Rise of Skywalker is that it's been crafted by uh, story specialists and it's beautifully done. I mean, every single step is exactly this, this cycle precisely. They start in the ordinary world. They come around, they refuse the call at first. Why should I change my life? I've got a great life here. They cross the threshold. In fact, they actually descend. In the yeah, film, they, they go through that sand that sinks them yeah, to the underworld. Is they actually do descend. And, and I, that's why I think that they are professional brilliant story writers. Well, that's who, who why really it's a perfect, it. This is perfect to go over it with the hero's journey because it is. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, they see the monster down in yeah, underneath do. the world. And then, of course, they have to, uh, she has to meet, particularly, um, uh, I can't remember his name, the Seth Lord. Sith Lord. Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren. Oh, right. <laughs> well, I would not have remembered that, as you can see. So once this is the point of revelation, this is also... Um, this is also the point of no return, uh, a very uh, key moment in any movie, the point at which the value of going back is greater, or that the sort of the onus of going back is greater than the bonus of going forward. So they have to go forward, it's inexorable now. Now you've overcome the very, very worst part. And you know, I think, I really do think you can use this as a metaphor for anything that you're trying to overcome yes. in your own lives is that you you have to actually sort of transcend and go through the really nasty dark bits otherwise you don't progress the same with creative blocks the same with uh, writing anything if you don't go through the dark stuff you can't get to the good stuff and some of it is obviously by contrast um, yeah. the other thing though we talked about this is like if it was easy, if these, if there was no tests or challenges or anything, I mean, it's not really that much of a transformation. Yes, absolutely. Like, obviously, it's like well, it has to be worthwhile. It, it has, has to, to be, be worthwhile. Like, yeah. And so the, I think changes in your own. One life. of the other things that we were yeah. talking about was um, the book *The Alchemist* by oh, yeah. Aurelio, which um, which is is pure sort of story theory. It's just about somebody who is forced to go on a journey. It's a circular journey. They find their sword and then they return home the hero um, and the transformed hero. So they had everything they needed at the beginning. They mm. went away. In fact, actually, one, the last Mad Max film was exactly the same. They go on this incredible journey out to somewhere and then they come back. But they're transformed, of course. And I, I can't quite relate it. I'm trying to work out how to relate it to Casablanca or something like that. Because <laughs> that doesn't quite work. But Lawrence of Arabia, brilliant. That works. That is about the transformation of a human being and the transformation of a nation as well. So then, then you, once you've gone through the dark abyss, then uh, you've gone through death and rebirth and you can see how this relates to religion. I oh, know I'm not allowed to talk about it, but I've just mentioned <laughs> it. Uh, and then you seize the treasure. This is, this is the moment of the thing that you thought you needed, you find. And I uh, suppose that the, um, the interesting thing would be in, um, in uh, Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail, of course, he is then on the final test, which is the Holy Grail, which is the right one. What he chooses is not because he's clever, it's because he learns how to value the simplicity of things. And so he chooses the simplest cup of all. 
So the transformation is in himself, really. Although he chooses the right um, grail, the, the right cup, he chooses it because he learned that he has to be much more, much simpler in his life, and he had to shed all the bravado and the complexity that he had before. So there's another simple. Then, of course, you've got your treasure, you've got everything, and then there's a final sort of roadblock, as it were. Um, so this is on the road back home. So this is then almost the triumph. Usually there's yet another obstacle to overcome, but now we prove that the person is transformed. And then we have what this part, which is called resurrection, which is the resurrection of the spirit. Um, sometimes it's sort of the physical resurrection of something, you know, like, um, uh, I can't remember what the film was where they say, build it and they will come. That was actually physically demonstrated Oh, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams, exactly. So for, for, for them, the resurrection was to build it and they will come, and they did come. There was a resurrection in, and I mean, a literal resurrection. They brought people back from the dead, which is incredible. <laughs> and then you return home with the prize. But the thing is, and this is why it's circular, because it, you'll do it again. As, as the beginning, if I'm not mistaken, the beginning of The Hobbit is he's already, he already has the ring, but he has to, he loses it and has to get the second ring. I have to check by, by literature on that, I'm not quite sure. Um, but you return with the prize and you return to the ordinary world, but you're transformed. But you're that, so you have to, you have to come back to where you were. You have to live a different life though. Now you are different. So, and this illustrates to me more than anything else that stories change lives and not just in movies and not just in books, but this is pretty much the metaphor for, um, for, for any challenging problem that you come to in your life is that you have this cycle to go through in order to overcome it or you don't, you just stay sort of happily in the ordinary world and nothing changes. So that brings me back to the philosophical point is that stories are about transformation and change. And that that is how we judge progress. And that, again, in fact, the metaphor of the story is almost the metaphor for the story, because that's exactly what happens in stories. Um, so I think that they're always about transformation and change, despite waiting for Godot. And I'll work that one out. I'll find a counter argument one day. <laughs> but I haven't got it. But really important point, I think, is that, um, that, of course, stories aren't necessarily about good or evil, although they are internally. And they can just as easily transform things into the dark side, the very dark side. So you can see how easily, you know, overcoming um, a, a, an abyss or a, 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 an obstacle or whatever can also be negative. And I think that um, that works also when we know that the brain works by building these assumptions, by these stereotypes and then these beliefs. It's the same thing. If you, if you build on a negative platform, then that cycle will work on the negative platform and you will find yourself building and rebuilding because of the way you look at life and things. Um, there is another method of um, looking at stories and um, I'm just going to very briefly show you this before we completely run out of time. Um, and this is based more on sort of uh, speeches, talks. This is from Nancy Duarte. Um, who has analysed many speeches, but particularly <coughs> a Martin Luther King's speech. Now, she basically says that stories are a constant battle between what is and what could be. And she's mapped Martin Luther's um, speech, the I Have a Dream speech, into this. But it, it, they start with what is, that is normal, ordinary life. And then they say, this is what could be. And then we come back down and then we go back up again. So in a sense, all of these are, you know, what must we overcome? What must we do? And how good could it be? But it isn't that way yet. And it will be. So it's the same. You could see this as a cycle. She sees it slightly different, more linear. 
but you'll notice at the top right hand of the top one on the on the the basics of structure of stories is that she believes that then you come to a new bliss and this was the great vision you know where where she says you know where uh, martin luther king says i have a dream or churchill says you know we will fight them on the beaches we will never never give up so um i think that's also a really interesting way i think the two things work perfectly together one happens to be circular which sort of makes a little bit more sense to me this is an analysis and she's done it by analyzing all the words i think the so, other thing to think about too and this is with the hero's journey is that the call to action or <coughs> the um the hero's plan it's usually about one big thing a yeah. vision it's always about something bigger than themselves um it doesn't they have to overcome some sort of ego so it's always about a bigger purpose or bigger vision and that's what charles and i have been talking about with you know um pretty much all of our our um webinars is flow you know what's your one big thing what's your deliberate practice um how are you going to reach your goals but it's always Absolutely. about having a bigger purpose than yourself and i feel like when you're thinking about your own hero's journey it's what is that what is that community what is that purpose what is that drive that's going to actually allow you to transform and become maybe more or um a bigger version of yourself knowing that you have all yeah. the tools um, um there was there was an example that we're going to give um next week we're going to sort of talk about the oh, yeah. patients and stories but there's there's a sort of example to give which sort of combines what we've been talking about and some of the things we've talked about in the past as well is uh, Roger Bannister of yeah. course who um prior to Roger Bannister running the 4 minute mile of course everybody thought it was physically impossible for a human to run faster than 4 minutes uh, a mile in 4 minutes um what Roger Bannister did if you accept a slight sort of shift in um in metaphor it, not metaphor in in meaning is he changed his mental story that's basically what he did he first of all he said right uh, it must be possible and if i do this 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 and this which was his plan and he failed many times before he succeeded of course we only listen to where he succeeded but he changed his mental story um and stories are things that we repeat again and again and again in our minds every day every minute of every day because that's how we're crafting how we view the world so if you change that internal story mm. then um well according to someone called jim quick um you become limitless which is i, I wish i had used that word but i didn't he did um and he has a sort of a, a small um method of looking at this as well which is based on three um basic uh, needs which is motivation methods and uh, mindset and that sort of brings that back round to that so i think i i hope that all makes sense uh, all the slides will be available on the replay um there's a few more as well that i haven't sort of shown because we didn't quite get round to it um if you don't love stories then i don't think you're actually alive at all so um you can't be you must be a or a zombie stories are what really i mean we've just told you a story so stories are what binds us together it's what the whole meaning of everything is all about is the stories that we tell um So next week what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and look at practical applications of stories where do we use stories in stupid simple things or very complex things sometimes where do we use them to actually sort of change lives change communities change buying patterns change behavior um change the car that you want to buy how do people use stories to do that so that's what we're going to look at next week which I'm really looking forward to because then we're not talking about fairy tales we're talking about how fairy tales work in real true life so yeah. but we are still talking about fairy tales and i love fairy tales so right. and then also i think um charles is also going to go over the pixar pitch which i oh yeah uh, you'll have to wait till next week to figure that out 
but you'll, you'll yes. want to hear about it. It's going to be a really a very practical application of all, everything that we talked about today. Hopefully you got a lot out of the hero's journey. You figured out where you are in your hero's journey. I, I think I wrote in my newsletter this week that I'm always in the challenge obstacle section. <laughs> But we'll move, we'll move, we're moving forward. So yeah, the, the timeline is sometimes much longer than it is short. Exactly. So um, I invite you to join us next week and we'd love to see you. And 